Welcome to Carito Connects. I'm your host, Jen, and I've been conversing with friends around the world about life challenges and impactful moments. Conversations on this platform look at answering the questions, how we overcome challenges and how our experiences shape who we are and the work we do today. I hope this work can inspire you on your own personal and individual journey. Let's dive right in. Hello, my guest today is Joan Hyman, my yoga teacher from LA, a dear friend and a mentor. Hi, Joan. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Thrilled to have you on our first episode, Joan. So just to give everyone who's listening a quick background on Joan, Joan is originally from Philadelphia. She started off her career as a dancer living in New York City, Vegas, and eventually found her way to LA. She discovered yoga during this time and has been taught by many of the renowned teachers we know of today, including Lisa Walford and Annie Carpenter and the late Monty Esrati, in which we are doing this recording on her second anniversary since her sudden passing in 2019, a few days shy of my own training with her in Tokyo. Joan left her dance career and devoted the rest of her career to yoga, having spent the last 20 years teaching at Yoga Works school founded by Mati, as well as Wonderlust, where she was the director of the teacher trainings before she decided to leave and begin running her own teacher trainings at studios around the world, of course, until COVID hit last year, where she then created the School of Yoga. So as yogis, we often talk about the different things we encounter and the challenges we have and how we overcome it. Um, So if you follow Joan, you'll see a lot of this come through in her social media posts, in her teachings. But I just wanted to invite Joan today to talk about where she is today with her challenges and some of the obstacles. Um, And let's just dive right into this conversation. So I'll let you uh, chime in here. (laughs) Um, Well, yeah, it has been a journey. And um, COVID uh, has definitely flipped my world upside down. Um, But, you know, I have to say, I think a year and a half after the pandemic, you know, officially kind of uh, discombobulated our lives back in March, I'm starting to see a new horizon and it feels really good. And I think this interview is actually perfect timing um, because I'm starting to feel like the COVID quarantine life is behind me, at least here in the United States. Uh, You know, um, at least half of us are vaccinated. So everything is starting to open up. Um, The LA yoga scene, which you know, I've been a part of for over 20 years. And I came, you know, this is where I came as a baby. And it really helped me grow as a teacher. And I studied with amazing teachers here, including Mati. She was my mentor for 20 years. And she died uh, two years from this date um, today. Uh, And I wonder if her soul knew that COVID was going to happen. And she just said, you know what, I'm not going to be a part of that. (laughs) I know she was not a big fan of teaching online. Um, And it broke my heart to see all the yoga studios closed, especially the big yoga studios. Yoga Works went bankrupt. And at one point, you know, all of my jobs, you know, I had lined up for the uh, year ahead got canceled. Um, And, you know, you try to swallow that as a yoga teacher and a freelancer. There's just no work for a year. The studios are closed. All the studios you taught at and all the privates I had in on the west side of Beverly Hills, Bel Air, where I used to live, um, you know, they fell uh, apart as well. So, um, yeah, this has definitely been a year of picking up the pieces. And uh, it kind of forced me to create a virtual platform, which I wanted to do before, but I didn't have the confidence or the time before. And sitting at home, and I remember I spent like a couple months just sitting at home and I was lucky enough to do my zoom classes, but I really missed the teacher trainings and I had a tarot card reading and she said, you're so ready to start that school and you're actually in a perfect place to start it. And that's all I needed to hear. And then I approached the teachers who I really look up to. And I was so honored. They said, yes. And then things started to come together. And now, you know, it's July. So we're halfway through 2021 and the studios in LA are starting to open. And it's my dream. The, the studio that I taught at for 15 years is opening up based on community, not corporation. And so I'm going to be a part of that. Um, and, and so now I'm kind of reflecting on my life and realizing 
you know, you just have to hold steady to what you really want and what's authentic for you. And it's amazing how it starts to unfold. And, you know, along with the Center for Yoga opening up, I have my yoga school. I'm starting to see some really good things on the horizon. And it's like I could take an exhale finally. (laughs) So you had mentioned that, you know, when turbulence comes, you have to really hold your ground. What do you do to help you stick to that? Well, I practice. I've always been one of those um, students that I'm very dedicated to the practice. And I practice like two hours a day. And I do it first thing in the morning, uh, six days a week. You know, and sometimes it varies. I might only get an hour or an hour and a half in. Saturdays, I just rest my body. But I, I get up and I do a long meditation. If I didn't have that, that's my anchor. That's my rock. Um, and also sticking, I have the same teachers that I go to for probably well over 20, 25 years. And even though I know their style, um, I'm, you know, going back to them helps me stay connected to my roots and this idea. And this is what I get from my self practice. Why did I embark on this path initially? So every time I practice and every time I see a teacher or a mentor that I've studied with for a long time, it brings me back to the heart of why I'm doing it. And um, that really helps me stay the course. So why are you doing it? Because I love it. <laughs> um, you know, the first the first time I did yoga, actually years ago, the first time I did yoga, we're talking in the early 90s. I was still a baby. I was maybe like 19 or 20. Um, it was Shiva Nanda and it was really, really slow. And it just didn't vibe with me. I was a dancer. I was into fitness. I needed to move my body. Uh, And it wasn't until about five or six years later when I was in New York City. And, you know, I had lost my mother as soon as I moved to New York City. So I was going through a hard time. And I was I was using a lot of drugs. And I was part of that nightlife in New York City. Um, And a friend of mine, and actually a, a boyfriend of mine at the time, and my cousin, both, you know, encouraged me to go to yoga. And I went to Jiva Mukti. And Jiva Mukti, that, that closed, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. But it, it, that was a huge yoga studio in the East Village, right next to the subway, the L train. And that, that, that type of yoga, it flowed, it moved, there was community, there was a vibe. So that really hooked me. And I remember the first time I did that style of yoga, I felt so open and stretched and just clean And that's really what planted the seed in this voice when I got out of Shavasana. It was so loud, like, I have to change my lifestyle. And, you know, just having that seed, it it took a year, but I started going to yoga all the time. I just made it work. And if I couldn't go to class, I would put my mat down. And I mean, maybe I was doing stretch yoga, but I was was doing something. And I think being a dancer, I already had the discipline. Um, And a year later, I ended up, I booked a show in Las Vegas. And I lived down the studio, uh, street from a studio. It was a hot, it was a Bikram studio. And I started even just doing the Bikram series. And once again, I was still kind of approaching it from a physical place, but it made me feel amazing. And it was a detox. And I think that's what I needed at the time. My body just needed to purge. Um, and I met a great community of people that were really into yoga. Um, and I was introduced to Ashtanga. And I started dabbling with Ashtanga from the David Swenson book. You know, and somebody told me I should go to Yoga Works and study with Mati. And I remember the first time I heard Mati's voice, and this is like 2001. She had this really intense Mysore class on the west side at Santa Monica uh, Yoga Works on Montana Avenue. And I, I was so intimidated by her being, but at the same time intrigued by her. And I actually walked out of the room. And then I had a friend, uh, encouraged me to come back the next day. And it was nice just to kind of have a buddy. And I went in the room with her. And I remember, you know, still to this day, Mati just always shook me like her voice and her presence. And the practice of Ashtanga yoga, that's what really grabbed me. And I realized and I still practice Ashtanga yoga today. That's my baseline. Um, But that really steered me on the right path. And you talk about what keeps me anchored. It's just it's that routine. Every time I practice on my mat, and especially with the Ashtanga, you know, Ashtanga yoga is a super deep practice. And I think it really works well for people who have intense personalities, a lot of type A people, people that hold a lot of stress in their bodies. And it's a great way because you're doing so much asana to purge, and then you just get still. Uh, And you always leave your practice completely emptied out. So 
that was really the beginning of this of this whole transformation I went through. So when you talked about um, your time in New York, your mom passing away, and mm -hmm. that period until meeting Mati and really diving into Ashtanga, how how long was that period for you? It was only about two years. You know, when I look back on my life, I always have these bridges of two years. <laughs> yeah. And that was really a bridge that got me from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, and, you know, Las Vegas, and people can say what they want to say about Las Vegas, but that was actually a very healing time for me. I had to get out of New York City. Uh, you know, it was just being so young. I was, I was a baby. I was in my young 20s. I was so vulnerable. And I was so open. But I just didn't have any tools. And when I went to Vegas and I kind of, and, and we're not talking the strip, you know, the, the, the Las Vegas strip is a whole different vibe compared to what life is like outside the strip, like outside the strip, it's kind of suburban, it's desert. And after, you know, I was a city girl, I grew up in Philadelphia. I've been in and out of New York city all my life. So to have all that space and to really meet people that weren't in a rush. And, you know, I, I met a lot of really good people there. And that kind of just pointed me in the right direction. And when I got to LA, once again, LA is a hard place to get anchored into because it's so big. Um, and that took me a couple years to really uh, stabilize. And I, I, you know, if it wasn't for the community and the yoga practice, I don't think I would have stayed in LA as long as I have. Yeah. I just, it was, it just resonated with me when you, you, you talked about building up to your yoga practice and how that really anchored mm -hmm. and grounded you. And the reason I asked about time frame was because personally for me, I think it's the same thing. Like you start, you know, you go to yoga practice and you, if you get hooked, you get hooked and you do it. But sometimes people deviate from it, you know, after a while mm -hmm. and, and those who stick to it, stick to it, but you don't really feel that transformation until a year to three years later where yeah. Right, where that authenticity of the practice, not only the asana, but then you build into the pranayama and then application of, you know, your habits, right? Mm -hmm. We always talk about your what are you eating, what are you intaking, your sleep. When the, all that kind of merges together, then it really transforms and, and really it takes time. It's not like I'm just gonna go to yoga practice and you know it, it's gonna make me feel better and because the inward outward um, journey takes time. So yeah. right, and that's really part of that healing. And and when you get to that point, you have an aha moment where you're like, mm -hmm. this is how I this is how I feel good. Mm -hmm. feel yeah. Good. Well and that's what happened. I started to feel like, you know, drugs take you to a level where you feel totally blissed out, but the come down is awful. And what happens is, you know, the more you use drugs, the, the, you know, you don't feel as good. You, you actually start feeling worse. And that's kind of what happened when I first got to LA, you know, I was still kind of dabbling in that party life, but I started doing yoga and I was really starting to feel good after practice. And I wanted to keep feeling that way. So I started doing a lot of yoga and even in my early days, uh, you know, because I was just learning primary series, I would actually go to a vinyasa flow class in the afternoon sometimes. And I just kept myself in that environment. And it was like the, 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 the good I felt from the yoga really started to, you know, it, it started to scale out. And it was just that became where I wanted to go as opposed to the nightlife and the partying. That, that just, just slowly started to diminish. And my friends changed, I think. And I see this in teacher trainings. Like when people start doing a lot of yoga, you're, you know, raising your vibration and your habits are going to change. Your conversations are going to change. You know, in your life, you start to manage your energy in a different way. And your life does become more about let me practice because, you know, by investing in your practice, that's going to heighten your energy. And so, you know, the friends that kind of want you to go out and party or go do this that's not where your energy wants to go. So all of that, it took a couple of years, all of that began to began to fall off. And then, you know, this bridge into the yoga world just got steeper and steeper and steeper. Yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it. Um, it's almost yeah. like, not to use the word addiction, but it's just kind of like mm -hmm. putting your energy elsewhere. Right. So when, when mm -hmm. you were using drugs at the time, it was like, how you were feeling the moment you were in, you would revert that direction. But as you found yoga and it gave you that same high of intensity, 
you, you started shifting that direction. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I remember, you know, I, and I was always lucky. I had a lot of mentors. I had a lot of people that were always a little bit older than me, more experienced and really held my hand. Like I, I really felt like I've had a lot of guardian angels and I would talk to, you know, these people that were practicing, you know, like 20 more years than I had been at the time. And also, you know, uh, like maybe six years into my Ashtanga experience, I went to Mysore, India to study with Patabi Joyce. And I was with all of the, you know, all of the certified Ashtanga teachers and watching them. And they had had so much more uh, years of practice. They would always tell me, just keep practicing. You're going to find because and I tell this to people in the beginning of the yoga practice, you're really working through a lot of your blocks in your physical body. And I remember like the first few years, I was always sore. Sometimes I would have rashes. I couldn't sleep. I was emotional. But it was like things were really coming up. And people would always encourage me to stick with it. They're like, you're going to start to see a shift after five years. And by 10 years, it, things are just going to feel amazing. Like you're going to do your practice and you're going to feel so energetic. And I've been doing that practice now for 21 years. And people still are like, how can you practice Ashtanga yoga? Doesn't it hurt your joints? But, you know, I'm past the Anamaya Kosha. Like when I practice, it heightens me so much where, you know, I, I really think I tap into my energetic body more than ever from consistent practice now. And it's gotten to a place like if I don't do it, I feel stale all day. So, of course, I'm going to do something every day. Yeah. Totally. I liked how you mentioned five to 10 years. I think that's very important. <laughs> like that's very important to point out. Consistency. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's really not, you know, again, not like a year or two. It's, and you said every day, six days a week. Now, you know, mm -hmm. even if you feel sick, even if you feel drowsy, you're on your mat, you got to move the joints, you got to move your body. And if you don't do it, you notice how your day doesn't feel as energized, right? So it doesn't flow. It doesn't flow. Yeah. 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 And, you know, like if you're sick, you know, if you, if you have a fever, you don't practice. Um, but, you know, there's always stuff you can do. You yeah. can do restoratives. You can rest. And I think now where I'm at with my practice, it's just like tuning my mind into a quiet space. It's kind of like getting that static out so I can really think clearly. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I want to just shift that focus now and mm -hmm. let's go into talking about teaching online and starting the school of yoga. So if you can kind of dive in there a little bit in terms of, I know you were very hesitant with technology. I'll still remember last March, 2020, when I said, Joan, you should do Zoom classes. <laughs> let's get- I know. Our You're the one. You planted the seed. <laughs> I was like, let's get all the girls together. And I'm terrible with time zone differences, but people in Europe and Australia and New Zealand, we can somehow get it to work. <laughs> Um, you know, and I know a lot of people who feel very strongly about, you know, needing to be in person and physical energy was very anti being on screen. But, you know, yeah, we're a year and a half in and everyone is doing it. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that transition um, and then also the school of yoga and, and which instructors are part of of your, you know, of your program. Yeah. yeah so right before COVID, I mean, you and I met in Goa. Um, and that was a dream of mine to really just, you know, run a teacher training on a retreat center. And I love India. I've always resonated with it. I, I've been to, I've spent a lot of time in India. Um, and you know, when I left that trip, I had booked my 200 hour and my 300 hour that following year. And so that's kind of where my head was at. I was like, I'll still travel and teach and I'll run my 200 and 300 hour in Goa. And then COVID happened. And, you know, when it initially happened, I think a lot of us just thought this was going to be a month vacation. We can rest. And then next month, we're going to go back to work. Um, and you actually gave me the nudge because you're like, why don't we all, you know, get together from Goa and do a Zoom class? Um, and then I had done a training in Auckland. So I was like, all right, ladies. And, and they had kind of, you know, said they wanted to do a Zoom class, too. And then my client was like, you know, get on Zoom. I'm actually going to book you for a corporate job. And, you know, he wanted me to teach meditation for his group. So I downloaded Zoom and then, aha, you know, I get these ideas. And as soon as I get an idea, it's like, cha-ching. <laughs> and I ran with it and I was like, all right, well, let me start some Zoom classes. And I literally emailed people. 
I emailed and, you know, I just sent some uh, Google Calendar invites. And I was like, all right, let me see who comes. People PayPal'd me or, or Zelle or Apple Pay. So, you know, all of a sudden, especially like that month of April, like I made so much cash. It was like all this cash was coming in. I had five Zoom classes a week. And, you know, it, it was like all those 10 years of me traveling and teaching really paid off in that moment. And, you know, like my traveling t- and teaching has been teacher trainings and retreats. Like I've spent a lot of time with my students and it was great to actually begin to teach group classes again with a student body that had experience and understood the foundations of yoga and being home and especially not being able to travel that really kept me going. Uh, and then it was a student of mine flux who is like a technology wizard was like, let me help you out here because I was collecting all this cash and my partner, who's a tour manager, like made me a spreadsheet. He's like, you know, let's get organized. And I think between the, and you know, also Fitzroy's into production. So he like had a camera and the mics and the lighting and he was my model. And then Flux did all of the tech technology side. She, you know, hooked me up with Acuity. So thank God for them. And this is what I mean. I've always had, you know, help and angels kind of, you know, I've just had to stay open. And so the two of them had really helped me get organized. And um, this, you know, I can't believe I'm still teaching these Zoom classes. I had thought, I I remember sending the emails out going, okay, by June. All right, I'll keep teaching when yoga studios open up. And now it's like, of course, I'm going to keep teaching them. And I love it. I, I absolutely love it. It's been a great way to stay connected to people. And that has helped me funnel into the school of yoga. And, you know, back when I taught the 200 hour, I was, I needed a 300 hour. I had done 200 hour trainings since 2009. And I'm talking two to three 200 hour trainings a year. So this is like 30 200 hour trainings. And I had left yoga works. You know, I was, um, you know, I taught at their teacher training department forever. I mentored tons of students there, but I had to leave yoga works and I had to grow. And then Wanderlust, you know, I taught there for a while. But they, um, you know, it was just so unorganized there. So I needed to figure out like my own thing. And I wanted to do something that really had authenticity and really stuck to the root of yoga. And it was interesting because after Mati died, I remember thinking like, yeah, you know, I want to put something together that really honors her and her teaching. And, uh, you know, I had seen her a couple months before she died, I actually was supposed to go to China and this gig got canceled. Nobody, nobody wanted to sign up for the weekend. I remember and I was kind of bummed, but I was like, all right, well, where am I going to go? I'm on the road. And Monty was teaching in New Zealand. So I, I emailed the woman in New Zealand who I had taught for. And she said, yeah, please come. And, you know, Monty was always sweet with me. She's like, you know, she comped me into the workshop. We went and had dinner and little did I know that would be the last time I would see her. But I remember having these long conversations with her and she was very unhappy about the way the yoga world was going. She thought it was corporate. You know, the yoga world was really losing its juice. And so I remember, you know, thinking, and this is why it took me so long to put this school of yoga together, because I really wanted it to be authentic. And that also meant asking big teachers like Annie Carpenter, who has her own school, Marla Apt, who's a senior Iyengar teacher. Jean Heileman, who I'm friends with, but Jean has her own school, you know, and Christina, who is more of my colleague and she used to be my student. Christina's always been great. She's a business person. She's always given me a push. And Christina and I are both two people that we get an idea and we don't really think a lot about it. We just go for it. (laughs) And then we start putting the pieces together as it's happening. And that's kind of what happened. I said, you know, I had that tarot card reading and Annie was the first person I called. Because I was like, well, if I can get Annie, I think everybody else, you know, I think everything else would fall into place. And she said yes. And like, you know, I was like, wow. And then I, I called Marla. I called Jean. They all said yes. And I just couldn't believe it, you know. And Christina helped me put the website together. And um, and before I knew it, we just started offering these online modules. And the response was great. And right now, I'm still doing these online modules. I'm hoping to eventually transition into teaching in person, maybe at some retreat centers, but it's working. And the the Zoom classes have been a really good funnel into these teacher training modules. So I have to say COVID 
shook me up, but it also really helped me kind of like create something that was a dream of mine. Yeah, that's really awesome <laughs> because as a student of the School of Yoga, the access to all these amazing teachers in all their authentic authenticity and their teachings has really been great. Like I think the add on of access compared to any other program out there is it's what differentiates the school of yoga from, from, from the other ones. So. Yeah. And the, you just, you know, for me to teach the whole thing or to just to have one style of yoga, I think for 300 hour students, you know, the yoga world is changing. It's, it's really becoming mainstream. And I love the fact that everybody who's teaching, you know, on the school of yoga has something, you know, completely unique to offer. Yeah. That, yeah, totally. I think every time I take a class from one of them, I'm learning something different. And it's like an add on of like an aha. Like I just, you know, talked to one of our other friends uh, from our program about, you know, just comparing notes on like taking different teachers classes and what you learn. It's like we're geeking out on, <laughs> you know, on yoga classes and, and talking about the different postures and asanas and the points and anatomy. And it's it's nice to have that expertise and access. You mm-hmm. guys are all very accessible. You have a question, you send an email and all of you guys respond, you know, and that, I think that's that community that's awesome. you're building. So I think that's very positive. And I would encourage anyone listening who's looking for a training to, to sign up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's definitely been a dream of mine. And, you know, and I've always learned this way and I wanted to create a 300 hour program where there wasn't pressure to finish it in one year. And, you know, for me to get my 300 hour I just took a lot of workshops at Yoga Works for four years. And it was Lisa Walford and Annie Carpenter who actually wrote a letter to Yoga Alliance saying Joan has, you know, has taken 300 hours of yoga over four years. And that's how I got my 500 hours uh, certificate. So just to um, wrap up with one last question and then we can Mm -hmm. throw in some advice and fun facts, but yeah. Prior to COVID, you and Fitz, who's your partner, you guys were constantly traveling to different places around the yeah. world, not being in the same place. So how has COVID obviously changed that relationship, right? And and once we can travel and everyone's back to their regular schedule, what do you think will be different in terms of that relationship that you have? Well, that's a good question. And we, we've, we've spoken about it. And specifically this weekend, we've spoken about it. You know, we joke around. Our relationship has moved very slow. Like we were friends for a year. And then, you know, it literally took us a year to start dating. And then, you know, it took us a year of traveling around the world, having this honeymoon to actually move in. And when we moved in, I still kept my apartment in Beverly Hills. So it was kind of like a mock move in, you know, (laughs) and we were still on this honeymoon. Like every month we were in another fantastic place. (laughs) COVID COVID married us. I mean, we went from a full on honeymoon to like marriage. (laughs) Yeah, you can come to the yoga class, like wearing like identical outfits. (laughs) I know like... Oh, my, my girlfriend said that she goes, cause she met us when we first got together, you know, we're, we're this couple. And now when she sees us, she's like, you guys have merged. Um, and you know, it, 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 COVID was hard for him because he's been working as a tour manager for 30 years. So this is the first time in his life where he wasn't working and being in the music business, like he's the last to go back to work. Um, and he's got a lot of energy. He's used to doing things. So this was tough for him. And I was very fortunate to have my teaching. Um, but I'm a free spirit. I, and you know, I like to be moving and grooving. So I think we really got to see the shadow side of each other. And also being home for a year, our nervous system, this was very unfamiliar for our nervous systems to understand what it's like to be in a place. Yeah. And we really dropped. But and they they say this with couples, COVID either made you or broke you. And we really, really gelled. And even financially, like, I'm not going to lie, like, this was really intense for the both of us, because we were used to making so much different money from all these different avenues. And he had to go on unemployment. Thank God the house was paid off. I had to give up my apartment in Beverly Hills. So we really had to put our resources together. And I think that really showed us how well we operate together. And we have each other's back. And that's what we got a year later. And we, you know, we were actually acknowledging this because 
we're getting a place in Brussels. So we're going to have two places now. And we're doing it also, he wants to be closer to his family. And um, we don't want to go on the road for two months like we used to. We're kind of just narrowing our markets down. You know, if we work in Europe, we can come back to our home in Brussels and vice versa here in America. And I think, um, you know, knowing that and understanding that, you know, we had this year to really, um, you know, just solidify, like, you know, and get into that deep foundation of trust that happens in a relationship. Um, I think going forward, uh, you know, we, it, it's going to be great because two years ago, even though we loved each other, there wasn't that foundation. And now it's like, there's that root. He, he's walking in here. He can hear me talking about it. So, uh, <laughs> so we can go back to separating. Cause I'm not going to lie. I think the two, the part of the reason why this works is the two of us actually like to be alone. We like to be with someone, but we also like that deep quali- quietness that comes with solitude. So I think it's just rooted us even more. And going forward, there's just a deeper love and a deeper trust for each other. So it kicked our asses, but it, it did us some good. Talk about a top up. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, okay, so let we'll, you know, we'll kind of wrap up here. But like, do you have any advice um, for people who are listening, you know, in terms of what they're faced with challenges and, you know, really going in and being accepting of it and acknowledging it, overcoming it so that it really helps shape them as an individual. And maybe if you've been reading any books you'd recommend right now or picked up anything fun that you've learned recently, like a you know, new new skill set. Uh, and then my last one is like your favorite asana right now. Okay. Um, okay, so my advice for people going through a hard time and is to really stay the course. There's something beautiful about resilience. Um, but also, you know, Something that's very important to me is keeping my self-esteem up. So, you know, when I start getting caught in the negative or if I'm not feeling good about myself, um, really sitting there and evaluating what can you do so you raise your self-esteem. And um, also knowing that every time we're going through a hard time, it's not going to be that way forever. It's the hard time that is really, you know, polishing us. It's getting us, you know, deep into our being. So we can shed another layer of ourselves and, you know, a better version of us comes out. So stay the course, find a practice that's going to keep your energy elevated, whatever it is. If you're a surfer, if you like the water, if you want to be outside, but pick what you love to do and do that every day. Because, you know, if you can keep your vibration up, it'll help you stay the course (laughs) during those tough times. And also watch your dialogue. If you're with, you know, people that you're complaining and it's kind of pulling you down, You have to divert and be around people that uplift you and inspire you and always be around people that support you and encourage you. Yeah. Um, Now, what was the other question about Um, the books? Yeah, like a book you've been reading recently that you would recommend or something that you've learned. (laughs) You always ask me, and, and you know, this is my vata. I'm like a little hummingbird. So I usually read a bunch of stuff at the same time. (laughs) And I do listen to a lot of audio books. I think... During the pandemic, I listened to a lot of Carolyn Mace because she talk, she talks about, you know, going through a hard time and this idea of transformation. And she reminds me of Mati a little bit. She's tough. She's like this kind of grandmother, you know, but from Brooklyn. She just says it like it is. Um, and you just hang on to each word that she's saying. Yeah. And so she's written a lot of great books. Um, and I've listened to a lot of her audio books. Right now, not one is standing out. That's okay. But, um, but yeah, I think she's a great speaker. Um, recently, you know, I've just been dabbling, like, with yoga books, of course. <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> reading something by Iyengar right now. Um, you know, and some self-help books. I-, I think going back into the work world, too, and uh, after coming out of a year of some financial strain, I've been reading some stuff just about, you know, abundance and changing your thoughts and your views on money. Um, and that's kind of how my mind operates. I do bounce around when it comes to reading books, but I'm always reading something, you know, I'm always trying to improve something in there. Mm -hmm. My favorite yoga poses, I was thinking of this today too, um, are headstand, shoulder stand. I mean, for me, that just completes my practice. Uh, headstand is grounding. 
Uh, it's meditative and shoulder stand is nourishing. I just feel like it just cleanses me. And I love to do pranayama and meditate after both those poses. I did notice you did more shoulder stands this week. <laughs> I know. And it's also, it's hot here in LA. I know, and I know like I've been actually having people from uh, New Zealand and Australia take my class and it's colder there yeah. because, you know, Australia's on lockdown right now. In class. <laughs> Yeah, they're all bundled up. And I'm doing, if you if you don't know, I'm, I'm actually doing post- postures that help to get the heat out of the body. <laughs> <laughs> That's very thoughtful of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned that I always like to ask about the book question. I just find that um, books is just the basic foundation for referring to people when, when they come at you with, you know, yeah. with questions of like, you know, I'm feeling this way and they don't really know what to do. And I've found myself constantly kind of referring books that I think would be useful yeah. to them, you know, cause I, that's like the most, that's the easiest way I can say here, if you have time, read this, you know, it was helpful. Yeah. Me. It might shed a light for you. So I just find books is just really, really helpful in, in that way. Right. And you know, um, and I read this years ago, but Michael Singer has some great books on tethered soul the surrender experiment. And I've been actually recommending this book to a lot of people because um, we're all having to surrender. I mean, we're all living in a time where we don't know what comes next. And his book, The Surrender Experiment, really helps with that. Oh, well, I think that's it for this time. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for your time, Joan. (laughs) Of course. And Jen, it's always great to talk to you, you know, and I'm, I'm proud of you. You've been a great student and a great friend. And it's good to see you, you know, doing what you love to do. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening to Curito Connects. For more Connects content, collaborations, and discoveries set to inspire you on your own individual journey, please head to our website at www.curito.co. Until next time, stay inspired and thank you for joining us at Curito Connects.